Sup, homeboy, homegirl. I'm Leon the Paperback Maniac, coming at you with a brand new vintage book review. Today, we are taking a look at Down on the Farm by John Schur. This book was published by St. Martin's Press, first in hardcover in 1987, and then in paperback in 1988. Now, this has got to be one of my favorite covers from St. Martin's Press. Yes, it has a skull, which is certainly nothing new, yet at the same time, there's almost a kind of understated elegance to the whole thing. I mean, it has shades of the painting American Gothic, which it's clearly riffing on, but I mean, for my money, I will take this artwork over that overrated thing any day. So I will go ahead and start by reading the synopsis per custom. On an isolated Michigan farm, an old barn stands cold and dark. Animals shun it. People are chilled by it. And its owner, Casey Dubois, keeps it locked and empty. But empty it is not. Beneath the floor, an ancient presence stirs. A monstrosity of bloodlust, it is starved for the food of human suffering. It thrives on the possession of others, body and soul. And the Dubois family, close-knit and innocent, is the perfect fodder for the demon's foul appetite. As the beast tightens its infernal grip on his family, Casey Dubois must fight to save everything dear to him, including his eternal soul. I love how that synopsis makes this novel sound like your run-of-the-mill demon-from-hell story. Refreshingly, it is not that, but uh, we'll get to that. So, the book opens with a prologue, which is par for the course with these 80s horror novels, uh, set in 1809, when a mysterious egg-shaped object, a UFO, uh, explodes out of the sky and crashes into a wilderness clearing in rural Michigan. Now, inside this uh, egg-shaped alien capsule is an amorphous red blob, and within the blob... Uh, a little thing kind of slithers free and crawls out. Now this thing is about eight feet long and three inches wide. It, uh, it has innumerable legs like a centipede's, uh, each uh, leg ending in a pair of double claws. It has a hideous uh, triangular face and sort of uh, mantis-like, uh, insect-like jaws, and, um, and it is just repulsive. Basically, now this this creature uh, scrabbles insect-like out of the mothership and starts furiously digging a hole around the half-buried spacecraft. And it digs and digs until eventually it, it has a hole big enough that it can bury the entire spacecraft. At which point, it then burrows back down into the dirt and uh, rejoins this uh, red jelly-like blob, which it's symbiotically linked to, and then sleeps for the next couple hundred years or so. Now, we flash forward to the present day of 1987 and meet our hero of the story, uh, high school shop teacher come farmer Casey Dubois. Now, it's summer. Uh, this is another summer book, and uh, school's out. And Casey is excited uh, to let the agrarian side of him loose for the next few months. You know, so he's a teacher, uh, but he's also a farmer. So at the start of the story, he is heading home uh, to his uh, farmhouse. And, um, you know, Casey is the, the salt of the earth. He's basically, you know, he, he's a reliable, earnest, dependable guy. Everyone likes Casey Dubois. Uh, of course, you know, he's physically perfect. He, he's, he's well-built, he's handsome, he was like an all-star athlete in high school and college. Not only is he physically perfect, uh, but he's born of a moral fiber as well. He knows the difference between right and wrong. Now, uh, normally, I would roll my eyes, as I'm sure a few of you are right now, at the, um, you know, like, ostensible sort of uh, perfection of this main character. You know, this righteous and, like, outwardly just perfect guy, yet the author uh, describes him in a way that actually kind of sells it. I actually kind of buy this guy, and I, I kind of like him as well. I can't help it, this uh, Casey Dubois. He's, he's a likable guy. Uh, 
So at the start of the story, he's heading home to his farmhouse and he pulls up to the barn. There's this massive monolithic barn that uh, kind of dominates the rural landscape and commands all who pass by to look at it. He pulls up there and we get our first bit of ominous foreshadowing when Casey discovers a dead cat lying near the barn. And he, he approaches this cat, and curiously, the, the thing is completely desiccated and shriveled up and dried up, almost like a mummy, which is weird considering it was alive less than like 24 hours ago when Casey last saw it. So he decides he better bury this thing before his kids come home from the last day of school. So as he grabs his shovel, he notices uh, a red uh, root that seems to have uh, penetrated the cat anally. Seems to be kind of growing inside the cat. Now he is completely repulsed by this. He, he takes his shovel and with all his might, uh, stabs down at the root uh, to sever it from the cat, but he finds that the, uh, the root will not be uh, penetrated at all. Uh, then suddenly the root withdraws from the cat and uh, burrows back down into the earth. So it shows that it is actually alive. Now, Casey at this point realizes that he is dealing with something, not your average plant, he's dealing with something completely alien to his own experience and something that clearly is you know, unnaturally alive and must be malevolent and pure evil. So then we kind of get uh, into the mind of this alien entity uh, which has been uh, sleeping under the, the earth uh, for the last couple of hundred years and sort of trapped down there because in the intervening years since it sort of crash landed on earth and buried it itself to hide the spacecraft uh, underground, this barn uh, had been built. And so now it is trapped under uh, concrete and it has been growing weak because it cannot... It, it has been sending out occasionally pseudopods, such as this uh, red root-like thing that Casey saw, to sort of go out and try to find nourishment to sustain it. But it, it but it's been you know gradually over the past few decades growing weaker and weaker, and all it can do is sleep and sort of dream these evil dreams. Um, and it wants to be let out of there, of course, right? So now because of this cat, however, because the pseudopod had sort of um, kind of gotten some sustenance from this cat and then taken it back down to the, the mothership and fed it into its blobby sort of cellular mass, it is starting to, to, to gradually uh, regenerate itself and grow stronger. And as it grows stronger, it starts rebuilding some of its critical faculties, such as telepathy and dream interference. And it isn't long before it starts sending its uh, dream interference to the Casey household. In, in fact, uh, Casey's wife, a coy yet ravishing woman named Anna, or Annie, uh, you know, at the start of the novel, is horrified one morning when she wakes up to find that she had a wet dream, apropos of nothing, that caused her to climax in her sleep. And, you know, she's a proper country wife. She's very disturbed by this. Oh, what came over me, you know? She almost finds that that was a betrayal of her uh, marriage to her husband. And then the thing starts also sending its influence to Casey's kids. Casey has a five- and a seven-year-old kid. It starts sending them strange thoughts and feelings and its goal ultimately is to um to, to send to send these thoughts to the family to influence them to basically open up a hole in the the cement under under the barn a hole big enough that it can float its spacecraft free and sort of escape into hyperspace so it actually has an agenda. It actually, you know, wants to ensure its survival and be free like any living thing would. Does this necessarily make it evil as, you know, Casey keeps saying and as the author repeatedly reminds us? Well, not per se. However, the, the entity certainly does have evil tendencies, such as uh, one dawn when it sends its evil aura into the hen house where it possesses a rooster to uh, take care of its immediate needs. And what would its immediate needs be? Well, of course, to satiate its 180 years of sex and bloodlust, of course. 
So it possesses this rooster, which goes on to viciously attack a, a hen, this poor hen, which it um, starts battering and mauling uh, as it rapes the hen, and it's using its talons to like claw at the hen, and um, and while it's you know clawing at it and sc scraping it and scratching it, it's using its pointed beak to sort of hammer down on the hen's delicate skull, and then it starts pecking out the eyes. And um, I wrote some quotes down because it's truly some of the imagery in this book is quite visceral. So. So there, so it's on top of this hen, and it's kind of you know they're kind of uh, thrashing all around the barn. Uh, they flop about with the rooster on top, quote unquote, like some macabre form of piggyback. And then, as it's using its beak to sort of uh, uh, peck out the hen's eyes, it says it's uh, it's pecking out the eyes, quote unquote, penetrating the liquid pulp of the corneas like scissor points stabbing a grape. That's lovely imagery, right? So it eventually uh, completely mutilates this, this poor hen and then is, you know, uh, momentarily satisfied and then, you know, withdraws from the rooster uh, and leaves the rooster back to its own devices. And let me warn you, if that wasn't enough animal cruelty for you, later on, this uh, pseudopod, this uh, quote-unquote what, what the author sometimes refers to as a horror peed or a devil peed because it has all of these, you know, legs like a centipede. Uh, later on in the book, it goes and um, basically uh, attacks a half-grown bull and basically uh, shreds the bull's nose and throat from the inside out. So, uh... If you are sensitive to animal uh, violence in books, tread carefully here. <laughs> That's all I got to say. But um, yeah, so so basically, you know, Casey realizes that he's dealing with some otherworldly menace and he tries to put a stop to it. And um, the book ha definitely has, um, like I said, a lot of uh, visceral imagery. It it's quite uh, violent at times. But um, I got to admit, you know, for a pulp horror novel, there's a lot to recommend here. There's, there's definitely a lot to recommend. Um, unlike a lot of pulp stories, uh, this one actually also, aside from all the violence, it does touch on some raw human topics such as uh, marital jealousy and also the complex uh, feelings that an adult male uh, can have toward uh, a teenaged girl. In fact, there is a fascinating uh, rumination in this book on um, sort of like the idea of, of, a, of a father or even an adult male pulling away from his uh, teenage daughter once, once the girl reaches a maturity that makes the father feel uncomfort uncomfortable, basically. Uh, basically due to like a deeply ingrained uh, and societally reinforced fear of um, incest and, um, it, you know, incest and you know, feelings like that, it basically makes the father feel uncomfortable and not really get too close to his daughter or too close to any, you know, girl of that, you know, maturity, teenage age. I found that a really interesting idea, which I had not really come across, <laughs> certainly not in a Pulp Hort novel like this. Um, so, you know, there are ideas like that, I absolutely loved this arthropod-like alien creature. I loved the physical aspect of it, you know, the fact that it has all of these, you know, these 30-odd legs, each of which end in a double pair of claws. You know, I loved the mantis-like triangular head, the chillingly human eyes. It, you know, has these creepy human eyes in there, um, you know. And, and I loved the fact that it... Uh, you know, how it works, the fact that it's, you know, sending out these thoughts and feelings to get what it wants. And I love how coldly calculating it is and how it coldly appraises the human race as, as essentially these kind of dull and inferior uh, beings that it can easily manipulate and, you know, ultimately are not, in its estimation, much different from like the lower life forms on Earth, like cattle and, you know, like chickens and things like that. And so, you know, and I really, as I mentioned before, I really like the fact that it is an alien entity from outer space and not just another demon from hell. That was really refreshing. Um, so, 
yeah, you know, lot, lot to recommend there. Let me see if I'm missing anything. I took, I took um, some notes. Yeah, I mean, as far as the characters, there's a balance of likable and unlikable characters. As far as the unlikable characters, like there's a, a teenage kid that is like trying to get in the pants of his uh, older brother who has left for college, his older brother's uh, ex-girlfriend. I found him to be completely unsympathetic, but unlike him, the girl, in fact, that he's trying to get with, uh, this teenage girl named Colleen, I surprisingly found her um, well-rounded and three-dimensional. And in fact, that girl, uh, Colleen, as well as Casey Dubois, definitely the hero of the story, and you actually do uh, want to see her succeed. Um, but yeah, you know, this book was absorbing and engrossing from beginning to end, uh, I even enjoyed the the climax uh, up until the Deus Ex Machina, which seemingly came out of nowhere. But, you know, in the back of my mind, I kind of knew it was coming. And other than the epilogue, which I definitely could have done without, I, I even honestly liked the, uh, the somewhat Spielbergian uh, note that it ends on. And if you're wondering what I mean by that, if you read the book, you'll understand. Uh, definitely has a little Spielberg in there. But... Um, yeah, it was just, you know, a fast-paced, fun read, uh, well-written, aside from the occasional uh, sort of clunky phrasing and superfluous words here and there. Um, you know, it's filled with fun, gory, over-the-top imagery. Although if you are, you know, I know that a lot of writers don't like necessarily descriptive or wordy writing. If you're one of the, uh, like a reader who, um, kind of grows impatient easily and just doesn't like, you know, wasted words to get in the way of the story. You may not like this as much as I did, but like the way that the author, for instance, describes uh, like a shaving accident, like when a teenager uh, accidentally slices open a ripe pimple and the greasy crater fills and refills with blood as he's attempting to blot it out with a wad of tissue. I mean, that's just perfect. Just the way he, he did that. It was just a really strong image. There's another image in this book uh, concerning a child and the child's mother. Uh, not unlike uh, an unforgettable image from the new film Hereditary, actually, that is just very haunting and just uh, stuck with me for for quite a while. So definitely has some effective writing. Um, but yeah, overall, this book do does get my recommendation. I enjoyed it. Um, a book like this reminds me why I like Pulp Horror. Um, it also reminds me why I enjoy St. Martin's Press so much. You know, there's just something undeniably fun and pulpy about their titles. They, they remind me a lot of the, the UK imprints, such as Hamlin and Star. In fact, uh, it's almost like St. Martin's Press is sort of like the U.S. equivalent of those uh, those U.K. publishers, which which I enjoy quite a bit. But um, really fun, and it actually did convince me that I think I'm going to do my next uh, collection overview on St. Martin's Press because you know I really every time I read one, I just I always have a great time. They're never perfect books, they're never like five out of fives, but they are definitely entertaining, and there's definitely enough merit, uh, you know, enough to merit a, a read. So I, I would encourage you guys uh, to, to check this one out, seek it out. I'm not sure what the availability is. I didn't check like what, what it's going for these days. The hardcover honestly might be a little cheaper than the paperback version. But, um, but as I said, uh, take my caveat, if you uh, are squeamish about animal violence or cruelty, there is quite a bit of that with this alien sort of like, uh, possessing things and, you know, just, uh, destroying these animals in the barn. It can be pretty horrific, but um, overall, definitely gets my seal of approval. I enjoyed it. So yeah, that is down on the farm. Hope you guys enjoyed the review, guys. Um, stay tuned for more uh, fun stuff coming down the pike. I got more uh, collection videos lined up and probably, you know, maybe another mailbox uh, video not too far down. So yeah, hope you guys have a great weekend. I will see you later. Peace out.